Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Optimization of Polybrominated Diphenyl Ethers Extraction and Analysis Using Accelerated Solvent Extraction and a Triple Quadrupole GCMS-MS Workflow. I'm Laura Bush, the Editorial Director of LCGC, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LCGC and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific, a world leader in serving science. Thermo Scientific provides analytical technologies, reagents, consumables, services, and software for cutting edge scientific research to routine industrial applications. This web seminar is part of an educational series to provide solutions to pressing application challenges. We have a few important announcements before we begin. The webcast is designed to be interactive, so we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can type your questions in the Submit Questions box below the presentation window, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking the Enlarge Slides button, also located below the presentation window, and the slides will advance automatically during the event. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the seminar, please click the Help button. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. We're very pleased to be joined today by Aaron Kettle. Aaron is the Accelerated Solvent Extraction Product Manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific. He works with key industry experts to develop improvements to the Accelerated Solvent Extraction technology so that laboratory and regulatory leaders receive the best possible sample preparation solutions. Aaron has been with Thermo Fisher Scientific for five years through Legacy Dionics and has held both sales and marketing positions. Previously, he was a commissioned officer in the U.S. Navy and served as a technical director and biochemist for the, De for the Department of Defense Forensic Laboratory. Aaron holds a Master of Science degree in toxicology from the University of Michigan's School of Public Health and a Master of Business Administration degree from the Lake Forest Graduate School of Management. Our second speaker today is Eric Phillips. Eric began his career working in an environmental laboratory, managing the extractions lab, and analyzing samples using GC and GCMS. Since being at Thermo Fisher Scientific, Eric has moved from technical support and training to product management and marketing management. Eric is currently the Senior Applied Markets Manager for the GC and GCMS product line. In his current role, he focuses on bringing solutions across the product lines and technologies to the modern chromatography laboratory. He has been published in the Journal of AOAC, written many application notes, given hundreds of presentations at conferences worldwide, and regularly post in the Chromatography Solutions blog. Eric holds a BS in chemistry and an MBA. Thank you both for joining us today. Aaron, please get us started. Okay, thank you, Laura. Hello, and welcome to our webinar on polybrominated diphenyl ether analysis using accelerated solvent extraction and GCMSMS workflow. Today, Eric Phillips and I will be discussing the use of the ACE system with triple quadrupole GCMSMS to streamline streamline and optimize environmental laboratory workflow. The emphasis will be on our latest application for extraction of polybrominated flame retardants from household dust. This webinar demonstrates how a laboratory can increase workflow productivity, method sensitivity, and analytical reproducibility by automating the extraction and using selected, selected reaction monitoring to eliminate the matrix and target polybrominated diphenyl ether congeners in household dust at low levels. The combination of these technologies dramatically improves the ability of environmental laboratories to quantitate regulated and currently unregulated compounds, such as those listed in the EPA's UCMR3. My portion of the webinar will discuss the role and importance of sample preparation for the analytical laboratory. I will cover the time distribution of workflow, what sample preparation is and why it is important for quality analytical techniques, review current sample preparation techniques for solid and semi-solid matrices, introduce accelerated solvent extraction and how this technique can be used to automate sample preparation, and discuss a few current environmental applications at use the ACE. This will set the stage for Eric's discussion on use of the ACE and triple quadrupole GCMSMS for polybrom polybrominated diphenyl ether analysis. Before we get started with the sample preparation discussion, 
I would like to take a moment to reflect on a common perception that often exists between analytical techniques and sample preparation. Pictured here is a Porsche 911. This is a state-of-the-art, innovative and expensive sports car. While performance is exceptional, maintenance is high, and the cost of ownership is high. It's great to drive when your budget permits. This Porsche is a great analogy to modern analytical techniques. Most GC or LCMS MS systems are on the forefront of innovation and offer amazing resolution and sensitivity. The cutting edge of instrument design and evolution is heavily focused on analytical equipment, and rightfully so. These instruments enable us to achieve high sensitivity in our analysis while offering numerous benefits to the operator. Taking the Porsche analogy a step further, this picture would be the automotive equivalent of sample preparation. This is a 1970s era VW wagon. The vehicle is aging, dilapidated, and the design is outdated. These two vehicles ultimately have the same manufacturer and is apparent where the efforts in design and innovation were spent, obviously the analytical techniques. However, it isn't necessary to keep this VW wagon as your second vehicle behind your Porsche. There are newer and more economical vehicles that will help you reach your destination. The same is true for sample preparations. With that thought in mind, let's jump into our discussion on sample preparation. The first step in our discussion of sample preparation is to evaluate the time scale that each step, to each step in the laboratory workflow takes. The laboratory workflow can be broken into four distinct steps, sample collection, sample preparation, chromatographic and or mass spectral analyses, and data processing and analysis. The pie chart here shows the results of a study published by Ronald Majors in LCGC Magazine. This article was written as a summary from a survey of leading experts in sample preparation and laboratory automation. In short, an international cross-section of noted sample preparation technologists from the U.S. and Europe, from manufacturers of equipment, academic, government workers, and industrialists, from the pharmaceutical, chemical, agrochemical, food, and environmental segments, were chosen for a survey regarding the role of time in an analytical workflow. A survey with questions regarding time distribution was sent to each of them, which they were asked to respond to. As demonstrated, sample preparation was observed to constitute 61% of the time required to complete the laboratory workflow. This, this is more the sample collection, analysis, and data processing combined. Going back to our car analogy, if we drive a Porsche for 6% of our total travel, would we want to rely on the VW wagon for 61% of our total travel? So, moving forward, what is sample preparation and why is it necessary? Sample preparation serves to ready the sample for either GC or LC analysis by using a solvent to extract the analytes of interest from the matrix. This accomplishes three things. It removes the analytes of interest from either a solid or semi-solid or liquid matrix, concentrates analytes of interest in the extraction solvent and readies them for derivatization if required, and removes matrix effects that may affect the analytical procedure. Since it co comprises 61% of the laboratory workflow, Sample preparation is the most integral component of the analysis. Any errors in preparing the sample for analysis through extraction can affect the recovery of the analyte and the quantitation using chromatographic techniques. A second study conducted by Ronald Majors has demonstrated that the sample preparation portion of the workflow is the single largest source of error, often resulting in greater than 30% variance in analyte recovery when manual extraction procedures are performed. To put this more poignantly, Renowned environmental scientist Dr. Robert Stevenson once indicated that 80% of the variance in an assay will usually result from the sample prep portion of the workflow. Considering that such variance can affect quantitation of the analytes at trace levels, the need for sample prep procedures that yield high percent recoveries and percent RSDs become apparent. Reverting back to our car analogy, if we are driving a top-of-the-line portion of a road that is partially paved with holes, cracks, and uneven pavement, we would surely expect the performance of the car to be affected. The same applies to our sample preparation techniques that yield poor and highly variable recoveries for our analytical procedure. Moving forward, let's take a moment to review what sample preparation techniques are often used in the laboratory workflow. These techniques can be broken into two categories depending on the sample matrix. One, liquid samples, with examples including ground, surface, and wastewater and two, solid samples, with examples including soils, air filters, tissue, and now more recently, household dust. Analyte extraction from liquid samples typically involves one of two techniques, liquid-liquid extraction and solid phase extraction. 
Since this webinar will ultimately focus on the analysis of flame retardants and dust, these techniques will not be discussed for this webinar. Analyte extraction from solid samples typically involves the use of one of four techniques, soxalate, sonication, microwave-assisted extraction, and accelerated solvent extraction. We'll now take a few minutes to discuss each technique and how they are used to extract analytes from solid matrices. Soxalate extraction is the de facto technique to extract analytes from solid matrices. This technique was first described in 1879 and has not changed much since that time. A schematic diagram of a soxalate system is shown to the right. The process of soxalate is cumbersome and exists of the following steps. The sample is weighed, placed into a thimble, and then added to the glass soxalate apparatus. A condenser is placed on top of the apparatus and a cooling liquid is turned on, which oftentimes is cold water from a faucet. The appropriate volume of sol sol solvent is measured into the reflux flask and the heat source is turned on. As solvent heats up and reaches a, its boiling point, vapors travel up the sidearm and enter the condenser. At this point, condensed solvent begins to drip into the sample thimble to perform the extraction. Soxalin is a well-established method of sample preparation that is continually used today. The biggest limitations of this technique are that the extractions are slow, typically ranging from 8 to 48 hours per sample, and a high volume of solvent is required to perform the extraction. Additionally, analyte recovery may be compromised from sample to sample and the solvent volume required for the extraction may vary considerably. Sonication extraction is a second technique that is often used for environmental samples. In this technique, the sample is immersed in a beaker containing solvent, and this mixture is sonicated to disrupt the solid. This induces partitioning of the analyte into the surrounding solvent, which in turn can be removed and used for the next step in the workflow. This technique has several limitations for environmental samples. It yields high exposure to solvents and must be performed in a fume hood. Extractions are very inefficient and low analyte recoveries are produced. The extraction process is very manual and labor intensive for laboratory analysts. And the extraction requires a lot of solvent per sample, typically between three and 400 milliliters. While this technique aims to advance the extraction process beyond soxalate, more automated and effective sample preparation techniques have been established. In microwave-assisted extraction, the sample and solvent are placed in a closed vessel and heated with microwave energy. The analyte compounds will partition, partition from the sample matrix into the solvent, and the high temperature facilitates this dissolution. This technique can often accomplish relatively fast extraction time, so long as the solvent and the matrix are able to absorb microwave energy uniformly. However, since no two environmental samples will have identical matrices, Use of microwave-assisted extraction may lead to inconsistent analyte recovery due to non-uniform heating of the sample. The following factors may affect the use of microwave-assisted extraction. Number one, extraction time. Number two, matrix uniformity. And number three, sample size. Matrix-assisted matrix extraction techniques tend to be limited to samples less than 30 grams. The final preparation technique that is used for solid environmental samples is accelerated solvent extraction. In this technique, samples are placed into stainless steel cells that are added to a carousel prior to the extraction. The instrument stores the extraction method and can mix up to three different solvents. Once the sample is ready to extract, the carousel rotates and places the cell into an oven with a programmable temperature. Pressure is used to keep solvent liquid during the extraction, and through both the use of elevated temperature and pressure, the rate of extraction is greatly increased. Accelerated solvent extraction is a well-proven technique that is EPA-approved for use in extracting environmental contaminants from a myriad of environmental matrices. This slide depicts the A schematic. The A system can use up to three solvents and does not need to be stored in a fume hood for the extraction. Once the solvents are mixed, they are pumped into the stainless steel extraction cell that contains the sample. The sample is heated and pressurized uniformly to ensure a complete extraction takes place. The overall extra extraction process takes between 10 to 20 minutes per sample. These are the results of two dynamic extraction cycles and a programmable number of static extraction cycles. These can be programmed into the stored method to ensure that all samples in a batch are extracted under identical temperatures and times for both cycles. By using this design, the ACE offers two distinct advantages over the other sample preparation techniques that we discussed. The first is that the extraction time will be greatly reduced for each sample, 
The second is the amount of organic solvent required for extraction is greatly reduced per sample. This slide compares the average extraction time per sample, including filtering if it's required. As seen, the difference between an ACE and a soxalate extraction can be profound. While the average soxalate extraction may take four hours minimum, an ACE extraction will take 20, 20 minutes maximum per sample. This slide compares the reduction in organic solvent usage for the sample preparation techniques that we discussed. Again, the difference between ACE and soxalate is profound. Since the costs of organic solvents can be high, one can see how the effect of reducing the amount of solvent required per sample will reduce the laboratory operating costs. Moving into the final part of our presentation, let's take a look at what the ACE can be used for in the environmental laboratory. ACE technology is widely used and accepted by the EPA for extraction in solid and semi-solid matrices. These matrices may include soil for a myriad of pollutants, air sampling cartridges such as polyurethane foam, and tissue such as fish or muscle. More recently, the ACE has also demonstrated that it can extract flame retardants from household dust. This will be discussed momentarily by Eric Phillips. This slide demonstrates the use of the ACE for extraction of PAHs and PCBs from both muscle tissue and soil, as published in Thermoscientific Application Note 1025. As observed, the percent recovery for each analyte is relatively high, and the percent RSD are low. These data demonstrate the utility of the ACE for full and reproducible extractions in two different environmental matrices. Obtaining these results is extremely important if trace level analysis is being performed using a triple quadrupole GC MSMS. This slide demonstrates the use of the ACE for extraction of perchlorate in three different food matrices, melon, corn, and spinach, per EPA method 314.1. The table at the left demonstrates the percent recovery and percent RSD for perchlorate extraction for each matrix spiked with three different concentrations of perchlorate. As seen, both values are excellent for the extraction. The figure at the right compares the chromatographic response for a non-spiked blank melon versus a 5-gram melon sample spiked with 10 ppb per chlorate. Per chlorate is well resolved at this trace level using ion chromatography. This is attributed to the excellent recovery during the extraction process. This slide demonstrates the chromatographic response of per chlorate in both a spiked spinach sample and a spiked soil sample following extraction by the ACE system. The chromatogram on the left shows that perchlorate can be quantitated at 10 ppb in a spiked spinach sample following extraction by the ACE. The chromatogram on the right shows that perchlorate is well resolved in the soil sample spiked with 50 ppb perchlorate following ACE extraction. Both of these chromatograms speak to the utility of the ACE system and how critical the use of a complete and reproducible extraction is for trace level analysis in a chromatographic system. So in ending today's presentation, I wanted to summarize the three key values that our customers have found in using this technology. The first, extraction time is greatly reduced, yielding, yielding greater productivity and higher throughput. The second is that solvent usage is greatly reduced, yielding greater cost savings for the laboratory. The total sample processing workflow is greatly reduced by eliminating the need for manual extraction procedures. This ensures that analysts can focus their attention on the analytical procedures. If I were back in the lab, I would much rather be driving the Porsche than the VW wagon. I would like to thank everyone for their time and attention. I hope this webinar served as a good educational tool to help increase your understanding and awareness of sample preparation and its importance in the laboratory workflow. I would now like to turn the discussion over to Eric Phillips and the analysis of polybrominated diphenyl ethers and household dust. Thanks, Aaron. Now we'll continue our discussion with the application of analyzing brominated flame retardants and specifically polybrominated diphenyl ethers. But before we get into the actual application, let's review some background of the compounds and why we should bother testing for them at all. PBDEs were initially used as flame retardants in the 1960s. They are currently used in a wide variety of household apparatuses, consumer electronics, furniture, and more. Certain congeners have been banned completely and are currently in the list of Stockholm Convention's persistent organic pollutants. Sources of human intake are typically ingestion, usually nutritional in, in nature, and the inhalation of indoor house dust. 
Due to growing concerns over the health, health risks from constant exposure to these classes of compounds and the accumulation effects in the food chain, suitable analytical methods are needed for low-level analysis in a wide range of matrices. In this application, the EI, Selected Reaction Monitoring, or SRM method, is highlighted, and a short comparison is made with negative CI, uh, with a negative CI technique. A broad range of PBDE congeners were analyzed, ranging from tri up to deca BDEs. It's not so much these compounds are used that is a problem. It's what happens when they find their way into places where they were never intended. PBDEs have contaminated food. They've been found in the human body and have been found in human breast milk. This class of compounds has been linked to cancers and learning disabilities. This little boy is one specific reason for me to be concerned. So now onto the application. In this application, we'll use the ACE350 to extract PBDEs from house dust. After the samples are extracted, the, quanta, the TSQ Quantum XLS Ultra will be used to analyze the samples. Triple quads, and this one in particular, have some distinct advantages when analyzing samples at low levels and matrices. You may be saying, hey, wait a minute. I can get low-level analysis without a triple quad. Single quad analyzing in negative CI and SIM can be very sensitive. So the question is, which is better? We'll also explore the comparison between negative CI SIM and EI SRM. Okay, before we go any further, we need to talk a little bit about signal-to-noise and selectivity. Here we see a plot of magnitude of signal versus selectivity. Signal-to-noise is a plot of selectivity versus magnitude. As selectivity increases in an analytical technique, both the signal and the noise response are decreased. The noise decreases at a faster rate than the signal, so the signal-to-noise increases. So let's take a look at the series of GC techniques. GCFID offers relatively low selectivity when compared to mass spectrometry but we do have a lot of signal. Next comes GCMS single quad. The selectivity jumps quite a bit because we're looking at specific masses generated from the fragmentation of compounds in the MS source. You probably noticed that the signal decreases a little, but the noise decreases a little more, and this is seen in the increase in selectivity. GCMSMS triple quad can dramatically increase the selectivity of analysis by taking advantage of the experiment that all triple quads were originally designed for, selected reaction monitoring. So did everyone notice that there's a really large difference between the selectivity of a triple quad and a single quad? To see why this is, we need to spend a little time to review how a triple quad works. Here we see a picture view of what's happening inside the analyzer of a triple quadrupole. On the top portion of the slide, you notice the data. This is the result of a selected reaction monitoring experiment, the real selectivity of a triple quad. Each of the arrows represents an ion. We're going to follow an ion's path through the triple quadrupole system. In Q1, we select one specific ion that was created in the ion source. In the case of PBDEs, this could be mass 721.44 or BDE183. This selection process is just like the single ion monitoring in a single quadrupole. This specific ion then goes through to Q2. In Q2, the ion from Q1 is fragmented by hitting a collision gas and some more energy. This produces a lot more ions. The good news about these ions is they are specific to the structure of the ion that was selected in Q1. In Q1, we got a little specific through the use of SIM. We selected one of the ions from the compound. In Q2, we allow for more specificity by fragmenting this ion into a set of ions that come from that specific structure. Now on to Q3. And in the third quadrupole, the fragments from the collision cell Q2 are analyzed by their mass. One of the product ions is picked for detection. In this example, its mass 561.76 from BDE 183. So we are monitoring a specific ion that was generated in Q2. 
That is the Selected Reaction Monitoring Experiment, or SRM. It's also referred to as a transition. In this case, we would be transitioning from IN 721.44 to 561.76. In Q1, we perform the SIM to isolate one ion. In Q2, we perform the MSMS to fragment that ion into a specific pattern. In Q3, we perform SIM again on the fragments to isolate a specific ion. We have dramatically increased the selectivity of the analysis. This SRM process only takes a few milliseconds. During the analysis, up to 3,000 transitions could be monitored. With such multiple transitions in one run, it's become referred to as multiple reaction monitoring, or, or MRM. Okay, so that's it for the compounds and the instrumentation background. Now we move into the actual analysis for PBDEs and house dust. We find out how careful you actually have to be when you're cleaning your house. First step, extraction. Aaron went through a lot of information on the ACE, so no need for me to duplicate it here. The flow chart shown represents the steps that were taken to extract the PBDEs from the house dust. 0.5 grams of dust was used as the sample weight. Methylene chloride was used as the extraction solvent. Once it's set up, the ACE350 did the exhaustive sample extraction with cleanup without the need for anyone, meaning the chemist could be doing other things because, as we all know, there's a lot of other things to do in the lab. After the extraction was complete, the sample was evaporated, and a portion of that was analyzed on the TSQ Quantum XLS Ultra. Now, as promised, we begin a bit of a comparison of analyzing PBDEs in SIM and SRM. We'll give as many advantages to both as we can or need to. In the SIM experiment, we will use negative chemical ionization. This will allow us to get as specific as possible for the PBDEs. There are far fewer structures that will provide a stable negative ion, and you can be pretty sure they'll contain halogens, and in this case, bromine. For the SRM experiment, we'll only need to use SRM. As we saw in a few previous slides, we can be very specific using this process. Here are the highlights of the methods that were used. It might jump out at you that a mixture of gases was used for CI. In this case, argon methane. There's no specific reason for this. Well, mostly because that's what we found in the lab. Just methane by itself provided the same sets of results. In SRM, there will be some of you watching that will notice the resolution setting on Q1. The TSQ Quantum XLS Ultra allows for higher resolution settings than that. It can actually isolate to 0.1 dA. That's Dalton's, also known as AMU, and in this case, in the case of ions, mass to charge M over Z. So for, you, for those that have noticed, and you know who you are, we did not need to isolate anymore. The physically wider openings of the quadrupoles for this instrument, and the selectivity afforded by SRM meant that we did not need to use this feature. Other matrices that cause more problems do, and it, just in this case, it wasn't needed. So here we see a mass chromatogram of the negative CI SIM work. All of the PBDEs shown are at 100 parts per billion, except for BDE-209, this one is a 10 times higher concentration. That particular PBDE is notorious for its ability to break down in the presence of heat, probably why these things are used as flame retardants. This is what it looks like in the standards. The peak shape is good. There is plenty of room to analyze much lower levels, as indicated by the standard injection. Now we start our comparison in dust samples. As we all know, analyzing matrix samples can be a lot different than analyzing standards. In this case, the same sample was analyzed in NCI-SIM and EI-SRM. The difference is obvious. There is matrix interference in NCI. It is not as selective, and the resulting peak seems almost non-existent. EI-SRM provides an easy-to-integrate peak at 0 0.07 parts per billion of BDE-47 extracted from the house dust. Another example is BDE-183 at 0.17 parts per billion in the house dust. 
there are coelutions of something in NCI. You cannot tell really what because it's not in full scan and it's only selective enough to know that it's uh, bromine, probably some breakdown product of another PBDE. EISRM provides an almost completely clean baseline around BDE-183. Just looking at this chromatogram, it indicates that you could go lower in our analysis, and we'll see that in later slides. Over the next few slides, we'll review some of the data from uh, the PBDE analysis method. Based on the last few slides, we decided to move completely to EISRM method analysis. Here we see two of the PBDEs, BDE 100 and 183. The peaks shown are at one microgram per liter level. Notice the accuracy at the lower end of the calibration curve. All right, so a detection limit study was done. The instrument detection limits were determined by using 10 repeat injections of a neat solution of standard at one part per billion level. The calculated standard deviation was then multiplied by three. For calculation of samples, calibration curve was set up using external standard calibration. Ideally, internal standards would be used for extraction recovery controls, but they were just not available for this part of the experiment. All results, therefore, are based on external standard calibration. Detection limits were calculated in spiked neat solutions by multiplying the standard deviation of 10 repeat injections times the three and shown in the table in the upper left of your screen. Overall, the method detection limits in the NEAT solutions were lower when using negative chemical ionization than with SRM. But when you get to real samples, EISRM provided the lowest levels with the greatest accuracy and precision. The ions used as qualifiers in EISRM are actual ions indicative of the compounds. That's not so with NCI-SIM. At best, you get 79 and 81. Several house dust samples were spiked at various levels, and repeat injections were performed. The table in the lower right shows the repeatability of several PBDE congeners at different concentration levels. The ion ratio deviation was determined by comparing the quantitation ion with the qualifier ions. Multiple injections of samples allowed for determination of area repeatability and ion ratio repeatability. The repeatability values are good even at the low levels, and the ion ratio deviation is very low. The ion ratio is calculated on the EISRM experiments. This would have been done on negative CI sim, but again, you only get 79 and 81, so that's not much use. I'm sure you are all like me in that if you say you have a method detection limit at a certain level, it would be great to actually show you can detect at that level. So over the next few slides, we'll show just that. Here we see two compounds. The top mass chromatogram is the quantitation ion and the bottom is the qualifier. These two compounds are BDE28 at 0.05 parts per billion and BDE47 at 0.03 parts per billion. They are spiked, uh, spiked samples that were extracted from the house dust using the ACE350. Notice the transitions. They are indicative of the specific compounds. So we have a method that is sensitive, reproducible, and selective for these flame retardants. Much the same thing from the previous slide. This time we're looking at BDEs 99, 100, 154, and 153 all of them at 0.3 parts per billion levels. The selectivity is seen in the transitions from the precursor ion, again, transitioning to the product. In this case, BDE, in the, I'm sorry, in the case of BDE 154 and 153, the quantitation ion, uh, as a quantitation ion, this is 643.53 to 483.73. Okay, last one, I promise. Here we see compounds BDE-183 and BDE-209. Remember, 209 is at a level that's 10 times higher concentration than the rest. The level shown for BDE-183 is 0.3 parts per billion and BDE-209 is at 20 parts per billion. Well, the ACE-350 was used for the automated extraction. 
This system provided an exhaustive extraction and cleanup. It also allowed the chemist to do some of the hundreds of other things you need to do in the lab because the extraction was unattended. In case I didn't make it clear earlier, a PTV injector was used. This injector allowed the samples to be injected at a relatively cool temperature, then transfer the sample and thermally labile compounds more gently to the analytical column. We found that EISRM provided much more selectivity for these compounds. Even though negative CI SIM provided the greatest sensitivity and standards, EISRM provided a method that was much more sensitive and reproducible in matrix. This made the peaks much easier to find, integrate, and quantitate. The software could handle this by itself, minimizing the need for any manual integrations. All of these advantages afforded by the ACE350 and the TSQ Quantum XLS Ultra lead to increased productivity. I'd like to thank you for listening to our uh, complete presentation. I'd now, now like to turn it back over to Laura. Laura? Great. Great. Thanks, Eric and Aaron, and, and Aaron, too, for your presentations. It is now time for the question and answer session, but I would just like to remind the audience that you can submit questions by typing them in a small text box that's not in the lower left-hand side of your screen, and, it's, and then just hit submit. Okay, so let's look at our first question. Um, is a separate cell used for each sample? Who wants to take that one? I can take that, um, yes. That would be correct. So okay. it, would be a, it would be a sequential extraction. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, Aaron, is there an A system available that works with a smaller number of samples? Um, yes, there is. We have what we call our ACE 150, which works with a single sample. So the choices are right now that system for one sample or the ACE 350, which does up to 24 samples. And how is the sample collected, and what size of collection vials are available? Um, typically, the, the, the size of cell would depend on the, the actual size of your sample. So um, there's a variety of cells available. Those are 1, 5, 10, 22, 34, 66, and 100 milliliter cells that are available. So, for example, if you had 5 milligrams of sample, it would be best to use a 5 milliliter cell. Great. In real samples, background bromine would be huge. How do you justify looking at this ion in, in NCI? Uh, this in, is very in, in CL, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Misread that. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, the, um, yeah, so the reason to go to negative CI, just to, we did it just to see if we could hit um, some really lower levels. And yes, um, we found just that, and that had been the problem in doing some of these analyses in negative CI. We were trying to give as many advantages as we could uh, to each of the techniques. That was the reason for the negative CI. Great. Um, bear with me. Let me just get pull up my next question here. Um, could you discuss aspects of GC columns for PBDEs? Um, again, this is Eric. So, I mean, there's a, uh, a fair number of columns out there um, that could be used. Uh, some of the trace gold columns uh, from Thermo can be, say, or have been made more specific for these types of analyses. Um, a lot of the, um, the issues that we ran into and continue to run into with this class of compounds is really the injection technique and how to transition from the liquid into the gas phase without having the breakdown. So that's where we paid uh, quite a bit of attention. We didn't spend too much time on column itself. We just picked one that we knew happened to work um, and uh, one of the trace gold columns, and we're ha I'd ha be happy to share that later. Great, thank you. Um, Aaron, do I have to use the same size cell in all 24 positions of the ASE 350? Um, no, you do not. Each position can use a different cell size, and you're not limited to only one size for an extraction batch. Mm -hmm. And how often will I need to buy and replace the cells? Um, well, they're stainless steel, so typically they're going to last the lifetime of the instrument. Uh, we've had customers that, you know, have used the same set of cells for over 10 years, and just a small amount of maintenance needs to be done. Um, there's a frit and a peak seal that will need to be replaced periodically throughout the lifetime of the cell. Great. Eric, how do you optimize the collision energy for SRM? Um, 
in the case of the TSQ Quantum XLS Ultra, it's um, uh, really an experimental way to do it. Uh, we have uh, books and, and several pieces of information, even complete methods already uh, that we generated that we're happy to share those methods with. So um, you will wind up with um, an already developed method that has the um, say best collision energies associated with it. If you're going to do it yourself, you do a series of injections on this instrument uh, to determine that. Um, other instruments uh, using auto SRM, so like the TSQ 8000 using auto SRM, that system can do it automatically. So it will determine automatically what's the best collision energy. So either okay. way, we can either provide the method uh, of something that's already developed or the TSQ 8000 could uh, do it, develop it automatically for you. Okay. Uh, next question. Um, in terms of the ASC, how much carryover will there be of analytes between samples? Well, there, there is an in-cell cleanup procedure that occurs that eliminates carryover for that. So um, that, that's actually a very good question. And we can definitely get you some more information on that. Laura, if you can take down that, the, the contact information and forward that to me, I'd be more than happy to, to send over the procedure that's used with the system. Perfect. Will do. Okay. Have you done analyses on food matrices? And if so, can you detect to PPT levels? Um, so this is Eric. Um, we've done, um, there's not a method coming to mind with these flame retardants in food samples. Um, I, I just, it's slipping my mind. P, other PCBs. Um, other, say, similar compounds, definitely not the same, but similar compounds we've done. Um, you can get into the parts per trillion level. You will need to adjust and uh, do some significant method development on um, potentially sample size in which to start. Uh, injection technique makes a big difference. Um, so getting down to the lower levels would probably require some more method development to get you there, but certainly um, larger injection volumes uh, are more than uh, useful in, in some of these. And potentially getting into these different matrices the, uh, with the TSQ Quantum XLS Ultra, uh, using that higher resolution setting to I better isolate those ions before they get into Q2 could help as you change matrix and get into these lower levels. Okay, next question has two parts to it. Would it be a good idea to analyze a low-level matrix like water and negative CI and other um, matrices such as sediments in EISRM? And the second part is, how fast can we switch? Um, if you're the, I guess the question, I guess. Um, Just question 12. Question here. Um, it, it might, if depending on the matrix background. I guess that's really what it boils down to. If you're, you, if you're talking groundwaters and, and uh, things that, that will definitely have some kind of background, still the EISRM would get you um, better, more consistent results across a wider range of samples, certainly, um, because uh, the matrix kind of gets eliminated from the data files, and, and you don't have the differences in the different water samples um, causing that kind of problem or, or um, fluctuations in the analysis. You could alternate between EI-SIM and EI-SRM. Um, you could do that, but uh, the length of time that it takes to switch between the two and the really I don't see any benefit in doing that. So um, you will wind up losing time, losing time actually analyzing where you know the analysis works best. Um, and if you're spending more time doing things that don't work as well, that means you're spending less time on things you know work much better. So you wind up losing precision in the method if you do that. Okay. So you could, don't recommend it. <laughs> Excellent. What is the difference in method detection limit between EISIM and EISRM when you monitor the same parent ion? Um, it depends on matrix, right? So if you're talking uh, 
drinking water analysis where the matrix is clean, so finished drinking water, it may not be hugely different. If you're talking about um, groundwaters, uh, dust, food, anything with a matrix in it, um, the EISRM will really be able to cut through the matrix, get you that much better precision at that low levels uh, where you need to reach, and then be able to be able to see those samples or be able to see those compounds in that matrix. So negative, uh, I'm sorry, uh, EISRM in a matrix that has some matrix behind it uh, will generally get you a lower level analysis. Okay. Can you scan negative CI and positive EI at the same time in your MS, MS system? And have you compared the regular injector and the PTV in PBDE analysis? Um, going between, alternating between EI and CI, uh, no, I wouldn't do that. Um, that's too much compromise on either one of those analyses. Um, so your sensitivity would, on either one would be really go terrible. Now, alternating between positive CI and negative CI, certainly that could be done. And that's just um, the detector being able to switch between um, uh, positive and negative detection mode. And we call that Pipanichi, and that's available on, on these systems. That's not a problem. That actually gets some interesting results. Um, now, the, uh, the different injectors. Um, for these flame retardants, they tend to work out better in the PTV. Uh, and they tend to work out better because you're able to inject at a lower temperature and then more gently transition from a liquid sample or, um, and ramping the temperature relatively slowly um, to transition those compounds to the analytical column. The split splitless injector, though it works, and we've done some work on that in the past, what we find is we get a lot more breakdown on these compounds a lot faster, and so your analyses um, are not near as sensitive. Okay. How do you manage potential cross-contamination between samples, especially when analyzing high and low concentration samples within a mixed sample set? All right, so I'm assuming this is on um, the, I'll go, I'll start with this being on the, um, on the instrument, the analytical instrument doing the analysis. Um, Aaron, feel free to jump in on the extraction side. Um, what, um, what we find you need to do is uh, we didn't really have much problems with the contamination once it actually hit the injector. And, um, so you ramp the, the uh, PTV, at, to a really high level to do a cleaning, uh, make sure you're flushing out the liner really, really well. And we don't, uh, with a flow of um, carrier gas. And doing that, we didn't really have any problems with uh, any carryovers. Now, certainly with the syringe, that's, that's always a possibility and an area of concern that you, you need to keep in mind. Uh, certainly rinsing the syringe a number of times. Um, and that's, uh, and even the tip of the needle can have a big effect. Um, I typically like to use a conical needle, needle rather than a beveled tip. The beveled tips tend to burr over time. They form this little cup that kind of hangs on to material and, and what have you. Um, that causes problems in a lot of, in some other areas too, but it can hold on to sample and it can cause some carryover and contamination. So um, certainly the, the syringe being rinsed uh, a conical tip needle, and uh, also some gas-tight syringes. Um, and those have on, um, uh, inside the syringe barrel, they typically have some kind of material at the end of the plunger that um, more um, completely scrapes the sides of the barrel of the syringe, and it's like a Teflon or, or some material uh, Certainly, a syringe manufacturer would be able to tell us more exactly what that material is, but um, that that those things really uh, eliminate the carryover. Great. Uh, let's just do one last question. Um, is the ASC 350 compatible with a solvent mix system from the older ASC 300, or does the 350 have its own mixing system? 
Okay, now by mixing system, is that um, for, for solvents or for cells? Can you clarify that a little more? I think they mean solvents. Okay. Um, yeah, basically what it is is the, the older ACE systems used uh, what we call a solvent controller that allowed multiple solvents to be used. The ACE 350 has that built in, and it can, use, it can mix up to three different solvents. So it still has that, that mixing capability. Fantastic. Well, Aaron and Eric, thank you so much for answering all those questions and for your presentations, too. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience for your participating today and your interesting questions. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's webcast possible. This webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through de December of next year. You'll receive an email from LCGC alerting you when the webcast is available. And we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who might have missed today's live event. We look forward to seeing you all next time. Goodbye.